All right, so today we are going to talk about not vision. Yay! Because, you know, this class has more than vision, um, it turns out. I know it's shocking, right? You guys all forgot that you had other senses. But you've got like five of them. Or more, it turns out. Um, so today we're going to talk about sound. So we're going to talk about some of the... Um, some of the functions of sound. And so the first question I have is, what are the functions of sound? Why do we need sound if we've got this great visual system that can detect all sorts of fun stuff? Sir? Can't see all around us. OK, there is that problem, right? So we can see here, but if something's going on behind you, it's nice to be able to hear it, right? Um, nice to be able to you know, know if there's an approaching car coming up behind you as you're jogging. Um, so you might want to have mount headphones on. Right, exactly. So if have you guys ever seen the um, bad lip reading <laughs> videos on YouTube? Did somebody say no? <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. These are hilarious. Uh, bad lip reading... What's a good clean one? Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney. hates me today. What's going on? Okay, I know, I broke the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Can you just act it out for us? <laughs> <laughs> I bet I could, actually, but it wouldn't be very funny. sister threw a sea fish at my TV. Hey, how are you? Ah, uh, cookies. Can I take one? Hey, thank you for the bench. Don't commit suicide. I will force spiders and badgers on the enemy and get them all to shut up. If Madonna married a real giant, that would be good. Mm, at least I think it would. Mm, wait, no, it wouldn't because never mind. <laughs> Happy stepchild. I told you to check it out. Uh, oh, hey, this is for the cow. In America, we have a song. Ding dong, Lama Wani jumping with a nice pig. She thinks I'm going in. Savior heard. Did the princess seize my buddy's boat? I, Captain. I'm very good company. <laughs> Be sure the pizza has an old fly in it. I didn't spend money on robotic things. Uh, I, I spend money on video games. We play pole position and go beat. We go fast around the track. Man, it was a good game. Because if Madonna had a blue statue, she just gobbled that sardine. <laughs> we got another rider out there pissing off people with a guitar. And they're a bunch of punks. 
Now you got me whispering to a freak who thinks that fish have menstrual cycles. <laughs> I'm freezing out here. Gotta get away. Hey, Amy left your party, and I'm leaving at three to pick apples. Are you a math dork? <laughs> and pork chops and beans and put it in the freezer and uh, you rotted after a month. Yo, mama's pudgy. Face it. <laughs> I want to hear you say bad about your mama. And then he said, prison. I'm a party rapper. That's how I am. Boy, these rappers and their beautiful Mexicans got to keep my mind free. Yo, mama can eat me. Centurions from East Asia near Mumbai got my cooler. And they took my spider jars into prison. I said, I'm going to let you do this. <laughs> Let's just go out and shop and grease a big nickel. I'm a gremlin. I'm leaving the party. And I want everyone to stuff the ice chest. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. So as you can see, they've got a whole series of these, and they're quite hilarious. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So being able to hear would be kind of nice, right? So you can see it, and it looks like he's saying those things, or at least you can convince yourself that he's saying those things. Um, so just having vision doesn't actually allow us to communicate very effectively. Being able to hear allows us to have language, for example, um, and a spoken language, and, and, and understand that. So what other functions do we get from hearing that we don't get just from vision? Okay, yeah, so vision doesn't always work, um, particularly, you know, once a day where it's dark, and then you want to be able to hear, you know, tigers creeping up on you and things like that. Or if you go blind, um, vision doesn't work in that case, and being able to hear would be good. It helps you know which direction to send your attention to. Okay. So if you know there's a big, you know, tiger growling behind you, you should probably look in one. Right, exactly. So if there's a bang over here then it draws both your auditory and your visual attention over there, right? So it, um, it allows you to integrate these things, right? Both um, sources of information. Good. Any other ideas? Oh, those are all really good. Um, so being able to hear allows us to, to tell what's going on. So this is the beat, um, the rhythm of a song, and... The question is, can you guess the song just based on the rhythm? The height of the bars doesn't mean anything, by the way. <laughs> I'm just giving you the rhythm. The dots correspond with the words, as the words are being spoken. Any ideas? You want to see it again? All right, hold on. Let me see if I can get to it before it goes. All right. Do you want a hint? Yes. It's a Beatles song. Help? Any other guesses? Let it be. Hey Jude. No one come together. Come together. Ah! It would help if I hadn't muted my computer. Sound the color of the dots mean anything? No. 
yeah, no. So there's all sorts of extraneous information that doesn't really help you. Really all, that, really all the information they were giving you is the onset of the words and the beat and the rhythm of the song. And you can't tell anything from the rhythm of the song because it's 4-4 you know, four, four time and all songs are in 4-4 four, four time, right? So that doesn't really help you. This is actually a great blog, you're not so smart .com, um, for sort of humbling you. <laughs> so letting you know that um, you think you know all sorts of things, but really you're just sort of filling things in and, and kind of guessing, um, which we've talked about a lot in here, that we use a lot of heuristics, right? So you miss a lot of information in the environment, you use heuristics to, to fill them in. All right, so let's talk about sound. What are the two possible definitions of sound? So English is ambiguous, Thomas. Um, so the first one I would say is Okay. And then the second one is the actual uh, electrical signals traveling through your brain that you perceive. Right. Okay. Good. Yes. So in English, we use the same word to refer to do two different phenomena. We re we use sound to refer to both the sensation and the perception. Right. So the sensation is the sound waves are pressure waves that are present in the environment, right? So there's the actual physical stimulus. So in talking about light, there's the photons, right, that move in waves and, and particles, um, and that's different. So light is different than color. Sound is different than sound. So the, we can use these two things analogously. So you've got your, the actual physical stimulus that's out there, as well as your um, phenomenological perception. So if a tree falls in the forest, it doesn't make, and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, it depends on what definition of sound you're talking about. So does it make a physical stimulus? Yes, of course it does. Does it make a psychological perception? Nope, it doesn't, because there's nobody around to have that perception. So the answer to that question is yes, both. Yes and no. Um, so there's a physical definition of sound, um, is pressure changes in the air or, or another medium. So you can have sound waves that travel through water or through, um, through solids. You can also, and then there's also the perceptual definition. So sound is the experience that we have when we hear. So let's talk about the first one, um, the physical definition of sound waves. So objects make sound by moving back and forth through rapidly 20 to 20,000 times per second. So those are the range, that's the range of um, uh, vibrations that we can hear. So we can hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So that's vibrations per second. Um, a speaker, so a speaker like these things hanging on the wall, produces sound by moving a diaphragm back and forth. Uh, it, this, so the diaphragm of the speaker moves in and out, pushing air molecules together. The diaphragm moves in, pulling the air molecules apart. And this, this, the cycle of this process creates alternating high and low pressure regions that travel through the air. So we can think about it sort of analogously with water. Um, so you have these waves that are moving out concentrically with water. But water waves and air pressure waves move in different directions. So water waves move up and down. Air pressure waves move backward and forward. So water waves are, are I forget which one is transverse. Water is transverse because the direction of movement is transverse to the direction of the, of the, of the waves. That's right. Um, sound pressure waves are not. Sound pressure waves, the pressure waves um, are in the same direction as the, as the direction of the waves. So the movement is in the same direction as the, as the direction of the waves. So sound waves are linear, meaning that the variation in intensity or the air density is parallel to the wave's direction of travel. It's unlike light and water, which are transverse to the direction of, of travel. Um, note that it's the sound pressure that moves through the air and not the air itself. So the air molecules stay relatively in the same place. It's just the pressure that moves. It's like a sports stadium wave. So when you do the wave, you don't actually move your seat, right? You just move up and down. <clears throat> so sound waves, invisible to the eye, obviously. You can't see them. Um, sometimes you can feel them, so um, you can feel the vibrations. 
Um, hearing is the predominant perceptual experience of sound waves, although you do have some tactile, um, some somatosensory perception that goes along with it. So usually when we talk about sound waves, we, keep, we like to keep it nice and simple. We talk about pure tone. So a pure tone is just a sine wave of a certain frequency. Um, it's the simplest form of a sound wave. The pressure variations are sinusoidal. And all other sounds are made up of combinations of pure tones. So you can decompose the, a natural sound, um, a natural waveform, any waveform really, into its constituent um, sine waves. So relatively simple sounds, such as those made by musical instruments, are made up of, of many pure tones. Um, complex sounds, such as the human voice, have energy at a broad range of frequencies. And the relative energy at different frequencies determines the pitch. So it's just like the wavelength and the colors of light. It's the wavelength of the sound wave. Well, not the wavelength. It's the frequency of the sound wave that determines the, uh, the pitch, what we perceive as pitch. So when we have any sort of wave, waves can vary in terms of their frequency and their intensity, right? So we can have a regular sine wave, and then we can have the same frequency of the sine wave that has, oh shoot, supposedly the same frequency, but I can't draw. There, there. All right, so these both have the same frequency. You have peaks here and here, here and here, here and here. But the difference is the amplitude, right? So this one has a lower amplitude, this one has a higher amplitude. So the amplitude is the difference between the highs and the lows. Or you can have something that's the same amplitude, but a higher frequency. So, what psychological phenomena correspond to frequency and amplitude? Oh, sorry, no. This is the first question. What is the amplitude and frequency of sound? I've just answered that. Shoot, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> All right, so this is the question that I wanted to ask. What is the relationship between frequency, amplitude, and loudness? Which one is physical and which one is perceptual? So let's talk about amplitude first. So what does that correspond to in terms of our perception? Okay. Well, the larger the amplitude is, that means it's louder, right? Right, yeah. So, yeah, um, that's exactly right. The larger the amplitude, the louder our perception. So amplitude is the physical st stimulus, and loudness is the perception. So the amplitude of sine waves, remember, or not of sine waves, of sound waves, remember these aren't waves that are actually moving like that. They're moving like this. So the amplitude is just the difference in the pressure between these things. So high pressure differences mean high amplitudes. Um, so you can measure the sound pressure um, in micropascals, which is the objective measurement, right? It's like saying in light, how many, how many photons are actually there? What is the actual physical stimulus like? And then your perception is measured in decibels. So a decibel is used to measure the loudness, not necessarily the amplitude difference, but your perceptual um, experience for these things. So what does a long, constant sound look like as far as a waveform? I don't understand. Does it go up? Do these waves indicate going up and down, or what? So the, no, the waves indicate the frequency, basically. So um, something that has a high frequency is going to have a higher pitch. We haven't talked about this. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. But um, so something like this, your perception of this and this is going to be that these are both the same loudness. So you can have the same sound, well, different sounds that are the same volume, but one is going to be higher than the other one. So that's what these waves correspond to. So the higher the frequency, the higher the, our perceived pitch. So you can have, uh, say, two Cs on a, on a piano, a high C and a middle C. The high C, the difference between the two is that the high C is going to have a higher frequency, the middle C is going to have a lower frequency, basically. Um, so a long constant sound is just going to be a constant waveform that just goes out for a long time. So the y-axis here is time. Sorry, x-axis. The 
the y-axis is going to be amplitude. Does that make sense? So like in this, it's one cycle in time, so how long it takes for one cycle. So things that have higher pitch are going to have more cycles per second. So they're going to be more squished within that, that time. Um, and then the amplitude just determines how loud things are. So basically, the larger the amplitude, the louder our perception of things. So for example, there we go. So that was a tone decreasing at one decibel step, so the frequency stayed the same and the loudness decreased. So you can hear that one getting quieter. Sorry. An increment of three decibels. And that one got quieter in increments of five decibels. So decibels are a little bit weird. Um, so decibels are measured as, so this is the formula for measuring de a decibel. Um, it is the pressure difference between the maximum and the minimum pressure, and P sub O is an arbitrary reference pressure. It's like uh, the air pressure at, at, um, at sea level or something like that. Uh, so it's usually taken to be 20 micropascals, referred to as sound pressure level. So it's just an arbitrary sort of constant. So each increase by a decibel yields approximately the same increase in subjective loudness. So that is, the log nature of the decibel scale compensates for the response compression of the auditory system. So what do I mean by response compression? Well, like in that first tone set, I didn't really tell the difference between the first and second tones as far as loudness was concerned. They were just Mm -hmm. Whereas I could discriminate better between the quiet ones. I don't know okay. if that's like an effect of this compression system. No, that's 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 response compression itself. So the louder it gets, the harder it is for us to, to determine the difference between them. So um, if I were to take a sound, um, let's see, that has well, so if you're talking about um, amplitudes. If you're at, um, let's pick an arbitrary measure of uh, 100 micropascals. So let's say that that's really loud. And you go from 100 to 200, you have a harder time telling that difference than if you go from 1 to 2. So you're, you're more sensitive at the lower end, and the higher it gets, the more louder it gets, essentially, the harder it is for you to tell the difference between them. And so if you have a log scale, then the absolute nature of it can change a lot, but your perception of it goes like this. This is a negative log, positive log. It goes the other way. So the relationship essentially is nonlinear, is the point. So if the relative amplitude increases by 10, the decibels increase by 20, basically. So if you multiply the relative amplitude by 10, your decibels are only going to go up. They're going to double, basically. So if you go from a relative amplitude of 1 to 10, then the number of decibels goes from 0 to 20. If you multiply the relative amplitude, so this is the actual physical measurement, goes up tenfold. So you multiply it by 10, your perception only doubles. So it gets twice as loud as this increases by steps of increments of, of you know, 10 times, basically. It confuses uh, how decibels are subjective, but the um, sound pressure with micropascals is objective. Because it seems to me like the decibel is still like mathematically, it doesn't change like 60 decibels is going to be 60 decibels just based on like the sound pressure. Right, it's, so the scale is more subjective. The measurements are, are objective. 
So it's sort of a hybrid of the two, right? So it was developed in order to describe your subjective experience of the objective world around you. So, so yeah, so the actual measurements are going to go up linearly, but your subjective um, experience is going to be nonlinear. It's going to be on a lot of scale. So it's sort of in between the two. So the scale is in terms that, that we can understand. So if I say something is twice as loud, that means that your <coughs> decibels have doubled. Um, so your subjective experience is, is, uh, corresponds to the decibels. But saying that something is twice as loud doesn't necessarily map on to the, um, onto the physical stimulus. So it's like saying something is twice as hot. Well, that doesn't make much sense, right? Because the, how hot it is depends on what scale you're using. Um, so Fahrenheit versus Celsius. So going from one to two degrees in Fahrenheit is not the same as going from one to two degrees in Celsius, right? Maybe that's a bad example. Forget the temperature example. Josh? I, I thought it was a good example. Um, I had a question with audio electronics. They always measure decibels with negative numbers, and zero is the loudest. And then, and that's weird. So like negative infinity is between the silent and No, I've never heard of that. Any ideas why they might do that? To be cool. As long as you can do that, is like you have like a high threshold that you can't cross. Like you can't cross the same threshold for this either. Right, sort of set an upper limit and then you just back away from that upper limit. Yeah, so I mean you can't you can't pump more sound through your speakers than they can handle, right? Because if you try and do that, what happens? It's just a click. Right, you blow out your speakers or something like that. So maybe it's just to set an upper limit and then relative to that upper limit. That would be my guess. I'm not. I'm not sure. I've never actually heard that before. As you all know, I like to make things up when I answer questions. I did look up the the vestibular thing though the other day, and I was right. I wasn't completely making that up. So my guess was good. <laughs> that botulism toxin um, actually causes a uh, uh, difference between your visual input and your and your um, vestibular input, and so that is a toxin. It's actually the most potent neurotoxin that we know of, and so it makes sense that you have. This, this uh, nauseous reaction to um, to being dizzy. All right, so yeah, I'm mean, I'm totally making up that, that answer though. So we'll setting see. an upper limit and then backing away from that. I'm not making up the decibel stuff though. So the decibel stuff actually works. So if you have something that's twice as loud, you can actually measure that in terms of decibels. You can't measure something that feels subjectively twice as well. I guess you could, but you need a different scale. We don't really have a scale for that. So decibels describe your physiological experience, assuming a couple of things. So if you look at the relationship between loudness on the y-axis here and decibels on the x-axis, you can see that it's basically linear, even though this is a log scale, right? So as you go from um, point 0.1, so this is just a <coughs> sort of arbitrary number, so point 0.1 of loudness up to 1 loudness, so that's 10 times in the objective measurement, you're really only going from, you're really only doubling the subjective measurement. So 10 times louder in the objective measurement doubles your subjective experience. Does that make sense? All right, so that's amplitude and loudness. What about frequency? How do we get different frequencies? So what is the relationship between frequency, tone, pitch, sorry, pitch, tone height, and tone chroma? Which is phys uh, physical and which is perceptual? Well, we know that physical part is the frequency. So how often the waves repeat, how many cycles per second you get. So what do we mean by pitch, tone height, and tone chroma? Right. 
Yeah, so the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. Um, anybody know what tone height and tone chroma are? Josh? Would the tone height be the amplitude of the individual constituents of the chroma? Um, not necessarily. So that would just be the, the power of different parts of the frequency, right? So that would just be the loudness of, so the amplitude corresponds to the loudness. Um, so it's slightly different. So it, it has to do with the, with the frequencies. Victoria? Um, one of the like, singing tones, they have the same loudness and the same like, note of the singing, but they sound different, like they have different frequencies because they're kind of blended. Yeah, so there is, um, there is sub some subjectivity to it, right? So not all frequencies with the same power are perceived the same. So um, you actually have some difference in how we perceive different frequencies. So frequency is the, is the number of amplitude cycles that you get per second. So it's measured in hertz, which is cycles per second. Um, the perception of pitch is related to frequency. So the tone height is the increase in pitch that happens when the frequency changes. So there's really not very much difference between tone height and, and pitch. So it's just basically how high on the scale it is, how high the pitch is. It's essentially two ways of saying the same thing. Tone chroma has to do with the timbre. I forget what these are. It's kind of painful, huh? So what was the difference between those three series? Serieses? Right, they're different sounds, but how do they differ? Right, exactly. So um, the little series that I just played, the, they, were, they were actually pure tones. So they were all sine waves, but they differed in their um, frequencies. So the first one was fairly low, had low frequency. And the next one was higher than that, and the third one was higher than that. And the little blips were just different durations of those, of those um, frequencies. But what happens when you add different pure tones together? So if you have pressure wave changes for a pure tone with frequency 440 hertz, if you add on top of that um, this one, it's at 880 hertz, and then a third harmonic at 1320, you get this sort of complex waveform. If you look at the waveform, though, you can sort of break it down into different units, right? So this unit repeats here and here. So you get basically three repetitions of this complex waveform. Interestingly, the basic, sort of the, the first harmonic, also repeats three times. So you can sort of decompose this. So if you, take, if you start off with this, you can do what's called a Fourier transformation and come back to the individual sine waves that, that make up this thing. So it turns out that musical scales are based entirely on these frequencies. And I kind of wish we had a piano in here so we could mess around with it. So the letters in the musical scale repeat, so A through G, is that right? Mm -hmm. I quit piano lessons fairly early on. <laughs> Actually, no. I took piano lessons for years, and my piano teacher begged my parents to stop making me take piano lessons. <laughs> I was that bad. Actually, I refused to practice that much. All right, so the letters in the musical scale repeat. Notes with the same letter have the same basic frequency, have the same um, tone chroma, basically. So they all sound similar. So an A sounds like an A sounds like an A. And the reason that they all sound the same is that you have a basic frequency, the first harmonic, and then all the other um, harmonics are just multiples of that one. So let me show you some examples, or play you some examples. These are not actually harmonics. 
It's a scale, yeah. All right, so this is what I wanted to show you. So if you look at, at A's on the piano keyboard, so I don't have any idea what these things are called. What's this low one down here? Low, low, low A? I don't know. We're going to call it A sub zero. <laughs> have the same tone chroma, but as you go up by octaves, you're increasing in multiples of the frequency, of the bass frequency, basically. So this A has a frequency of 27.5 hertz. As you go up, the next A has a multiple of that. So its frequency is 55 hertz. The next one is 110 hertz, 220, 440, um, 880, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, as you're going up octaves, you're just increasing in multiples of this basic, um, this basic frequency. You're actually about one. Yeah. Are these more up? No, yeah, that's right. So you're doubling the frequencies, right? Right. So 27.5, what did I say? Going up in multiples, sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. You're doubling the, the, the frequencies. So I think that this is actually... Yeah, so that was an octave, right? I always feel so incompetent, because I did quit piano lessons, that there are actual you know, musicians in, in you know, BYU classes that you know, know way more about music than I do. All right, so this I do know something about, so the audibility curve. So the idea is, well, you tell me. No, no, let me tell you. <laughs> Which direction do we want this to go? I don't think you guys know this, um, and I can't expect you guys to know this. All right, so the audibility curve um, tells us the, the relationship between um, frequency and your perceived loudness. So frequency and, and decibels, basically. So human hearing ranges, um, I mentioned earlier, between 20 and 20,000 hertz. And our greatest sensitivity is in the range of 2,000 to 4,000 hertz. Any guesses where human speech lies, what the range for human speech is? Sarah? Steve? I thought it was... Never mind, I don't want to say anymore. I can guess 2,000 to 4,000. Yeah, that's a great guess, and it actually turns out to be true. So we have the greatest sensitivity where we need it the most, essentially. So we use um, hearing a lot for communication, and it turns out that we're really good in the range that, that we need it the most. Josh? That's just like the, the primary tones that we speak in, and then the overtones that are present in our voices actually do span up to 20,000, right? Yeah, and you can go down as well. Um, so basic idea with the auditory response curve is that for really low tones, it takes a lot more amplitude. Um, it needs to be a lot louder for you to be able to hear it. Sorry? Doesn't, doesn't that range change with age, though? Because I know when you go to some points that you just can hear it, really loudly. Yes. Ooh, I've still got YouTube up. Do you want to hear some of these? I love this demonstration because you can't hear it. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can play these things on these speakers. They don't always work on the speakers in this classroom. Is that playing anything? Can you hear anything? Oh, yeah. All right, that's 8 kilohertz. Can't hear I can hear 12. I can hear up to 16, I think. I can barely hear that. Okay. Oh, yeah. there. Nope. Wait, he's not I heard it, I heard it like that. Was it sounded kind of like the speakers were having trouble with the same thing. Yeah, let's see I if we can get head. 16 kilohertz, because that's where I my ears. Okay, I can hear that. Ooh, that's obnoxious. <laughs> Why are you guys putting your fingers in your ears? <laughs> that doesn't even sound high. I can hear that, and it's... I think the speakers are... I think the speakers are... Yeah, not doing very well with this. Yeah, no, I don't think it's doing very well. Should we go to the other end? 
I don't think the speakers are doing well with this either. <laughs> we need better speakers need in here. Threshold <laughs> test on the speakers. <laughs> Those sound for this. Just this one. All right, so this actually illustrates the point pretty well. So this is probably not tw 20 hertz. It's probably, um, the speakers are probably doing some interpolation here. But I've got to turn it way up for you to be able to hear that very well, right? So our sensitivity in this lower range is actually pretty poor. Our sensitivity for the higher ranges, so the, the mosquito ringtones, particularly the, the first couple that we played, is pretty good. Sometimes when I'm walking and a car comes by with some like a blue face, I can't hear it very well, but I feel it. Right, yeah. yeah. So you can feel these things before you hear them. And you've got to turn these bases up way loud in order for you to actually be able to perceive them. So the lower you get, the louder it has to be for you to be able to, for it to really cross this threshold. So this is the auditory response curve. So at different intensities, um, sorry, at different frequencies, your subjective experience is different. So for things that are sort of here in your, in your maximum threshold, your lowest threshold is actually pretty, pretty good, meaning that it doesn't have to be very loud for you to be able to hear it. For these lower frequencies, it's got to be really loud for you to be, actually be able to hear it and be able to detect it with your ears. So your ears have um, different thresholds for these things. Christina? Yeah, so that's going to be a sort of a low frequency kind of thing. And so, yeah, you're, you're going to have different thresholds for these things. So you can construct what are called equal loudness curves, where you subjectively ask people to rate how loud is this, and then you can look at the, the, the physical measurement of loudness in, in terms of the decibels. So you use two standard tones. So, so for example, at 1,000 hertz, a 40 decibel tone and 1,000 hertz at 80 decibels, and you say, based on these two things, so this one's going to be twice as loud as that, right? Um, at the same frequency. So two tones played at the same frequency, but one is twice as loud as the other. And then you vary the frequencies and say, relative to that one, to this 40 decibel, 1,000 hertz tone, is this louder or quieter? And what you do is basically construct curves based on these two things. So this is 40 hertz. Uh, sorry, for 1,000 hertz, 40 decibels, and for things in that range, you've got basically the same threshold. But as you go lower, you've got to play it louder and louder and louder in order to be able to have the same subjective experience of loudness, right? Sorry, you have to play it at higher and higher amplitudes in order to, for you to have the same loudness experience. Does that make sense? I'm getting some confused looks. Sarah, what's confusing? Okay, somebody else want to take a stab at explaining this? So you have the sound, right? And then they give you a sound at different frequencies, and you have to adjust it so it sounds the same loudness to you. But the amplitude of the waves is different because you can't hear it as well if you are loud. Does that make sense? So you turn it up to make it sound louder. But so it's just low pitches, like you can't hear it? Yeah, yeah. that's what you're saying. Yeah, so that's this end. Low pitches have to be louder for you to have the same subjective experience. So you, you, you basically end up turning the dial up more for the low ones. Same thing to an extent for the high pitches. So you get sort of these things going on where you've got a, you're maximally sensitive around here, but then you go up a little bit and you have sort of a little bit of a dip. Um, and then beyond that, you just don't have any perception, depending on how old you are. Has anyone come up with an evolutionary explanation as to why high frequencies would be louder than low frequencies? Um, human speech is around this range in here, so you want to have maximum sensitivity for what you're using the most, basically. But as far as things on the extremes, these being louder than these, um, I don't think that there's necessarily an evolutionary advantage. Um, different animals use different ranges, right? So dogs can hear higher frequencies than we can. Um, elephants can hear lower frequencies than we can. Elephants use these low frequency things for, for communication, right? So communicating over long distances. 
um, they'll use these low frequencies that we didn't, just don't perceive, but they can perceive just because their perceptual mechanism is different than ours. So their ears are set up differently than ours. Um, so I'm sure there is an evolutionary advantage, an evolutionary explanation. I could make one up. A lot of you know, a lot of evolutionary biology is making stuff up. Sort of these just so stories. This is why the leopard has spots. So those were, oh shoot. Did those sound any different? Sorry, I should set these things up. I think they're done now. All right, so that was a reference. So this, the second set was a reference tone and then and the same frequency played, let's see, it was five decibels higher, reference tone, eight decibels, reference tone, ten decibels. So it was just increases in the same frequency of loudness. The first one was same um, decibels but different frequencies. So you could hear in the first one how it sort of sounded louder as it got higher. Maybe. Maybe I'll have to play them again. So maybe we'll start off with that next time and I'll play you those tones and we can see how.